Hi, I'm Danielle Hartman. It's time for another episode of Poured in PA, a series sharing the stories of Pennsylvania's craft beer industry. It's also time for church. In this episode, we visit two breweries that make their homes in former churches. First off is Breaker Brewing Company. We sit down with the team behind this coal region brewery and find out what all goes into building your own brewery. We got into homebrew by drinking beer, and um, it's just one of those things where, hey, what if you can put this into a beer? How would it taste? What if you put, you know, ingredient B into the beer with ingredient A? How would that taste? And over beers, things just start to they start to sound better and better. We've been friends for 90s, early 90s. Over beers, it's like that. Let's make beer. Let's try different things. So we built a little brewery in my garage brewed the heck out of it for the first year, and then I think we, uh, we decided that we're gonna try to make a brewery out of it. I think we were both probably feeling no pain at the time and said, hey, let's, uh, let's see what we could do. Let's try this and uh, see what happens. But and then the next day, you know, you're like, you think we could still do that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we went down to, there's a local homebrew guy, Kurt from Beer Solutions. <laughs> And uh, we bought our first kit from him, and that's how we started. And I think we did six batches on one of those homebrew things, and then we went to the scrapyard and bought some used half kegs that were there, cut the tops off them, put them on a turkey fryer, and started doing stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, well, like the first three breweries were just hobbled together with uh, whatever we can get anywhere. I mean, the, uh, the first burners you got from the scrapyard yep. on the bottom of a water heater. Our first cooler ran on my uh, grandmother's uh, air conditioner for years. Yeah. And uh, yeah, just whatever we had around. We brewed quite a bit. It was, every, you know, I won't say every day after work, but it was uh, maybe a couple times a week. It was a year of home brewing, and I think we said, let's go professional. Let's try to go professional. It was a couple years of planning that, putting it together. And it was, what, 2009, we got our commercial license in my garage, which was pretty much unheard of. So we had to go through all these hoops to, and get variances and all this type of stuff. But we said, you know, if, if we're going to start, let's, let's do as low risk as possible. And, and when we started you know, with the homebrew kits and we advanced from kits to doing our own thing because the kits were kind of limited and we wanted to do some wild things with beer. Well, we would brew them and our friends would come over and they'd be gone. So then we had to brew again. And it just seemed like we were brewing all the time, but we, there was no beer for us because <laughs> our friends kept drinking our beers. The garage got too small. Um, so we had uh, walk-in coolers in my garage and, and all kinds of stuff. And my wife wanted her parking spot back. So we had to get out of the garage. So Mark had found this, this property. Hey everybody, how's it going? We're here in the, what's going to be the new brewery. And uh, we just wanna thank everyone for a great 2016. We're looking for three things in a property. Good parking, something with a good potential view, which you get the view of the whole valley and then room to expand. So, so there's two, two buildings on the property already. So it kind of met all that criteria. But, it, you know, it was a little bit of work to buy it, but we... Uh... Yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> well, we were buying a, a church off the, off the diocese, and they were reluctant to sell to us once they found out we wanted to uh, put a microbrewery. took us a year to buy the property, and then it took us at least another year before we started brewing. We didn't originally brew in this building. It was everything was next door in our brew pub, which is an old uh, school. It was a uh, first through eighth grade and it closed in 1971. Since then it was used for CCD by the diocese until uh, I think it was 10 years before we bought it. So uh, 
It was pretty, it was, uh, it needed some work when we got it. A lot of work. This was the church. We had to dig the whole basement out, backfill it, pour concrete pads. And we, we poured it especially for, a you know, for the brewery. All the floors are pitched for the drains and everything like that. So it's, it's, it's really nice to work in. Um, and it, it, it's a, it feels good to be here. I, we, we don't really get any bad vibes at all. <laughs> <laughs> Our first system was a barrel and a half brewery that we built ourselves. We were distributing to about maybe 10 or 15 bars at first. After the first year of the one and a half barrel, we sold that one and built the three barrel system, which is right over there. Uh, we still use it for making some small batch, test batches and sours and things like that. Yeah, it was small, slow start off and then we kind of built it up. Tried to make as best choices as we can business-wise. I mean, we both have families and kids and stuff like that. So it's a lot to risk and we left really good jobs. A way to go forward is to kind of burn the boats. <laughs> and uh, uh, we, we actually were pretty confident um, because we were doing both jobs for quite some time. So we we're pretty confident everything was gonna work out, but it was still a nail biter leaving a, uh, uh, I was a systems engineer. Chris was a network engineer for a regional phone company. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, our, our ways are a little, a little <laughs> apprehensive about it, but support from our families varied from uh, person to person, obviously, and uh, I, I think in the beginning a lot of them uh, thought we were just trying to drink beer in a garage, and uh, maybe they were right. Yeah. But uh, it it continued it continued into uh, what it is. When I think they they started to believe that we were serious when we'd be you know, getting pounds of strawberries and actually hand juicing them at that time just to make one beer that was only going to be two cases. So I think they started to take us a little seriously when we started showing the dedication that we had. Had we started this when we were younger, before we got married, before we had kids and stuff like that, we, we could have been in a whole different place right now, who knows? But because of those factors, and there's nothing wrong with those factors, but it definitely made us think about every step like as calculated as possible to make sure everything was uh, successful. Northeastern Pennsylvania is famous for anthracite coal. We always say that everybody's Father or grandfather was a coal miner in this area, so as we were trying to come up with a name for the uh, for the brewery, we thought let's try to get something that connects to the area. So we thought Breaker Brewing Company kind of just works. At first, we had all of our beers with coal mine name themes, but it started to run out of names, so we just kind of do anything now. But next door, there's a ton of artwork. My father does all the artwork. He's a photographer and an artist, so and he's got hundreds and hundreds of views of old Wyoming Valley so it just all kind of worked and it you know pays homage to the to the people that uh, were from this area and are still from this area and it's like a little bit of a history tour as you come through and it, it kind of just works. Advice we'd give to a home brewer that has aspirations to do what we did. You know what? You have to be. I would say uh, you have to be a jack of all trades. Yeah. Uh, we both we could weld, we could plumb, we could do electrical, we could do construction. We, we've done everything. And we've had to do everything here to get opened up. And if you're trying to save money and get opened up at the same time, it helps to, to know all these things, or at least know people that are willing to uh, work for beer. And if you don't want all that, you just gotta have a big bank account before you start. Yeah, <laughs> that, that also works. <laughs> you know, everybody has different ideas of opening up and, and, and like, it, it's like this great pipe dream of, oh, I'm gonna run a brewery, it's gonna be awesome. And uh, in the reality is the brewing is only like 15% of it, 85% is business. 
and employees and staff and bills and all that crazy stuff. But yeah, but that being said, at the end of the day, it's uh, it's worth it because you're in it for that little bit of time. Yeah. You're in it because you love beer. Our church hunting continues at Church Brew Works in Pittsburgh. Not only does this historic building house one of Pittsburgh's longest running breweries, but also a giant rock from out of this world. We opened the Church Brew Works in 1996. We're standing here in this beautiful historic building. This was built in 1902, and it actually was a Catholic church. Twin brothers Lewis and Michael Beezer built and designed the church, and originally it was a Scottish-Irish Catholic church. It's a lovely building, it's very iconic, it's got stained glass, it's got cool architectural features, it's got beautiful Douglas wood floors, and even the bar itself was all adaptive reuse. We try to keep the architectural integrity of the building, so people are like, what was your interior design philosophy? And it was pretty simple. We just wanted to showcase the inherent beauty of the building and complement it and not really distract from it. Because of all the rivers, the coal, we developed the steel making. And Lawrenceville was a pretty strong glass making, industrial steel making place in the 1830s, 40s, 50s, 60s. As the mills developed, the community couldn't sustain and the technology changed and then uh, in the 1960s you know, the, the, the strength of the community started weakening, people started moving out. This place went from 2,500 parishioners to 200 and when they, they opted to close the school in the early 70s and then at that point the young parishioners move away to another place with a uh, school for the kids and then that sort of left this uh, aging facility and the diocese was forced to close it. The community of Lawrenceville was very supportive. Uh, they had concerns, it could get knocked down, and it was part of their fabric. A lot of them worshiped here, a lot of them went to school here, a lot of them had relatives that were laid to rest here. So they wanted to see this stay in the community and supported the project pretty widely. The diocese supported it. The uh, Capuchin monks, which are down the street, and Father Paul were supportive, and Father Paul, he would actually come here and drink with his big mustache, his Steeler shirt, and look like a typical German beer drinker here. We migrated away from like an English ale house and got into this facility, and I had worked in the steel industry in uh, Germany and been to some of the old beer halls there. I was like, well, this feels a lot more like Germany, so we decided to do more of a formal uh, sit-down menu, a little more elegant food. We do decoction-style lagers, which is a traditional German brewing process. These are steam-jacketed tanks. They're made in Vancouver Island, British Columbia, but we used all steel produced here from Allegheny Ludlam Steel and had it shipped to Canada. You know, I came from a steel background. This is Pittsburgh. We make damn good stainless steel. So I wanted to use stainless tanks in the brewery and in the fermentation and then you see a nice copper cladding on the outside. If people are coming to the Church Brew Works for the first time, they're, they're gonna be a little surprised. One, we have a full service bar, so you can get wine and spirits. Then we have six bright tanks behind the bar. So we got a lot of beers on draft. We even have some product that we can. And then we have barrel aged beers that we do in the basement. You can get those on draft. People get curious, what is that giant stone there? It's a full on, legit 800 pound meteorite. And this fell in Nanton, China 500 years ago. It was an actual witness fall. And somehow I had this zany concept that we wanted to make an old Stein beer, you know, a stone beer, and pay homage to the old brewing tradition where they would just simply hit, heat stones up, put them in the water, sterilize it, and sort of repeat, 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 and eventually get the water hot enough for a boil to make a beer. So I ended up buying four smaller meteorites. We put them in our pizza oven, had them soak overnight, get up to like 700 degrees, 
and then we took them and dropped them into the kettle. We couldn't haul around 800 pound meteorite and drop it in there. But we used these smaller stones and sort of did a traditional twist on a stone beer. And people can come up and take photos, rub it for good luck, and you know, check it out. And I think it's the biggest meteorite in Western Pennsylvania. When we opened in 1996 and even got in the project in 1994, the craft industry was really in its infancy in Pennsylvania. We had one brewery here, which was Penn Brewery, with the uh, Tom Pastorius, you know, a great trendsetter in the craft beer scene, really embraced lagers, the German style, the tradition of Pennsylvania brewing. On the other side of the state, we had Carol Stout, another great generational uh, founder in the business. And then I think in the last five years with this ability to do a tap room where you don't have to have a full service restaurant, we've just seen a explosion in beer, just like there's an explosion in coffee shops. So it's almost like go down the corner to your local coffee shop and get a cup of Java. And now it's like go down to your, you know, your local corner brewery and get a nice beer on draft. And I still think there's a lot more room for a lot of the smaller towns around Pennsylvania to continue to add cool boutique, local, smaller scale breweries. We'll finish this episode with a brewery spotlight on Molly Pitcher Brewing Company in Carlisle. Until next time. Cheers. Molly Pitcher is a local Revolutionary War heroine. Her name is Mary Ludwig Hayes. Um, the name Molly Pitcher was given to a bunch of women that followed their husbands or spouses, whatever, into battle. We don't have the only Molly Pitcher. They're all up and down the East Coast, but we like to think ours is the most famous and the best one. So uh, the story goes, she was, she was originally from Monmouth, New Jersey. At the Battle of Monmouth, she was uh, carrying water to the artillerymen and her husband fell. So she manned his cannon. And that's where you know, she became the Molly Pitcher that most people associate with because she was the first woman to actually I guess, step up and use the cannon during an actual battle. She then moved from Monmouth, came back here, lived here then until she died, and she's actually buried pretty much right over my right shoulder at the old cemetery. We're all locals, we all love our town, so we wanted to extend you know, some of our knowledge of our history here to everybody else. Here in Carlisle, we have the Army War College, which is great supporters. We also have Dickinson College and the Penn State Dickinson School of Law. So we see a decent amount of college kids. I mean, of course, not last year because they weren't on campus. Um, see a lot of professors throughout the summer with the car shows. There are some big ones that come here, spring, fall, Corvettes. This whole town gets, I mean, triple, quadruple the size on a weekend which drives business everywhere in town. So it's, it's a great thing. Um, we're central from, you wanna go two hours, you're at Philly, a few more hours, you're in Pittsburgh. Baltimore's close, DC's close. Just a nice little place to be, you know, five minutes out of town, you're back, you're out in the country. All kinds of good hiking trails in the mountains. And you know, if you're a hunter, we got state game lands and all that kind of stuff here as well. Market Cross was here, they, they brew there, but we were the first production brewery in Carlisle. You know, and since we started, there's been two other ones that popped up and another one or two I think coming. So I think we kind of got the ball rolling for Carlisle of this sort of, you know, with the breweries and the tap rooms and all that kind of stuff. We both started out as home brewers uh, years and years ago. I started this business with three other partners, opened this place up in 2014. Um, and then since then we have added a bunch more production. We have opened up another tap room a few blocks away from here. We started doing a lot more canning runs last year. Um, distribution has picked up a good bit. Still in a growth phase. I mean, we've only been open for about five, six years now, but still growing, growing pretty well. I got into home brewing, watching the Discovery Channel's, uh, the one that Sam Calagione did. I was like, I think I could do that. I started doing it, and then we started doing some home brew contest, and then whenever they yelled if I could come in and help, I jumped and it's been a journey. Right, I'm Molly Brewing Company, another Perkin Monday, Northeastern Double IPA, I'm passion fruit. Whenever Greg came in, he brought some stuff that we weren't doing. Like, even at that time, like, hazy IPAs weren't a real big thing. So Greg had some of his own recipes that we then scaled up. And uh, he was also into sours that we'd never done here before. So we also throw some kettle sours into the mix. A couple of other ones that were his homebrew recipes that we kind of scaled up and then tweaked a little bit here. So he definitely has his own style. I, I mean, I personally like 
Pilsner's and Pale Ales, and if it was up to me, I'd brew our Patriot Pale Ale every single day of the week, but that's not how business goes, so. We sort of pinball it off of each other. We come up with an idea, and then I'll sort of go over playing Beersmith and uh, work it up, and then he'll come back and uh, fine tune me back down to uh, bringing it back into what uh, Carlisle and everybody else would enjoy, sort of a little bit more than what my head's thinking on something. Our tap room opened in July of 2018. Um, we have two floors, giant bar, upstairs and downstairs. We have a back patio. We have a full menu, burgers, chicken sandwiches, french fries, poutine, all that kind of good, you know, what you think of brewery bar food. It's been fantastic, uh, 20 taps, just going pretty well for us so far. So <laughs> the community around here has been absolutely fantastic. Even whenever we were couldn't do any indoor dining and it was all to-go stuff, we had a lot of people coming in, getting food to go, leaving our servers fantastic tips. During the summer, we actually did a live on the, the farm. So out at Meadowbrook Gourds in Blozierville, we had set up a place to sell beer. We had bands, socially distanced. Everybody could rent a tent, bring six people with you. Everybody could have their own area. So during the pandemic, we tried to do a couple of different things to try to keep that bar vibe going, even if it necessarily wasn't inside of our bar. I'd say the community really sort of came out and just really showed support and just even during like the hardest of like when COVID was really coming out, they sort of were still always there and like we always had them, the locals that were like pretty much, if you were going at this certain time, you could guarantee to see them in their seats. This community has been absolutely fantastic. Um, I, Carlisle is just a great little town. I mean, we're locals, my, 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 our parents grew up around here. It's just a nice nice community and has always been a nice community. And it's so thankful for being here and the support that we have seen over these last, you know, the last 12 months of pretty crappy times for the bars and restaurant industry, so.